when I was in the building phase, I was working 120 hour weeks. I didn't have time to eat. I didn't have time for anything. Being an entrepreneur can be very lonely. And again, the higher you scale and the more you rise, the more lonely it can be if you don't have things in place to actually support you as you're going that. The challenges with the business structure, the strategy and the mindset are very different from scaling to six figures and then scaling from six to multi-six, multi-six to seven, and then seven and beyond. When you're starting your business, when you are starting to grow, especially let's say you're getting from that zero to six figure mark, okay? Feeling like you don't know enough or that you have to constantly learn more or wait until it feels like the right time this is a lie what's the relationship between leadership business and harry potter oh <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of The Scale Talks. And today we have a new guest, Rhiannon Leila. Hi. Hi, thank you so uh, much for having me. Pleasure, thank you for being here. Um, today we have a very different topic and it's going to be an interesting topic. It's going to be tips about how to scale a business where, when you're a woman entrepreneur. Sounds smart, right? Love it. I think it's an interesting topic because That point of being a woman in business sounds not that difficult when you're a guy. Oh, that's so interesting. And it sounds like, okay, why so much fuss about it? What's the point? And at the same time, when you're around there and you see groups about women in tech, women in business, it's like an association of talent and it's so powerful, right? So today the question is, How do you scale a, a business as a woman? What are the, um, the traps? What are the pain points? What are the difficulties that people don't see, but still they're around? And that's what we're going to talk about. So just a quick background. You've been in business for about 10 years. Yes, in correct. In the US, in Asia, around Singapore, mm -hmm. um, now in Europe, in Lisbon. Correct. Um, and your business is about coaching women into the way they do business so that let me um, tell let me know if I'm wrong but so that they can take control over the business so that they design their life instead of being the victim of the life they don't want to have something yes. like that yes this is a good way to put it so specifically it's hope it's helping women scale businesses online so this is more of a two-pronged approach um We do coaching and consulting to really help women get over a lot of these mindset blocks in order to actually grow and scale a business. And then on the flip side of that, I have a team that comes in and helps execute strategically marketing op and operations to actually help them scale. So two very different sides of the coin, um, very different pain points and very different problems, but cohesively they work together and they really support these women to actually scale six, seven and eight figure businesses. That's a lot to talk about. It is. So let, let's finish the, the, the background check first. Right? Okay, so let's, let's go check for the it. Boxes. The typical um, clients you're working with are small business owners, about 15 people in the team. Um, they can be so small business owners, but they can also be VCs. They can be auction houses, you told me, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. You're also a board director for a nonprofit, which is a different kind of skill, a different kind of skill scaling expertise, I guess. Yes. Um, and that's the, the little nugget, you know, PhD in international leadership ongoing. Yes. For fun. Yes. <laughs> that's some heavy stuff. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, so typically what we do in these podcasts is we talk about the operational side of things and we talk about the second uh, side of the coin, which is the mindset side of things. But I guess today it's going to be a bit Different in the sense that mindset is very much at the core of what you're doing, right? So it's It probably is. going to be a mix. Before we get to that, how did you start? What made you say, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur? Oh, good question. Um, I, I wanted freedom and flexibility and a traditional role just didn't offer that for me. So I started my business in 2014. So again, we're we're at the decade mark, which is really exciting and also crazy because time flies. But I had planned initially to work for a corporation, climb the corporate ladder, etc. And I graduated with my MBA and no one would offer me any flexibility, nothing. And I, I really I didn't want to be tied to a cubicle. Um, 
So I started traveling and I started honing my skill set in order to actually support businesses behind the scenes. And then it just evolved and grew from there. So what did you learn in an MBA? What did you not learn in an MBA? Oof. And why why do you say that nobody was giving you any flexibility? What were they actually where what box were they trying to put you in? Yeah, great questions. So honestly, I don't even know that my MBA was that helpful, especially in growing a business and being an entrepreneur. So there's a lot of strategies. There are different classes, of course, with ethics and finance and accounting. And all of these are important for businesses, of course. But actually taking these practical skills and becoming an entrepreneur and learning how to navigate pitfalls and, you know, clients who default on payments or how to find clients or getting out of your own way in order to actually grow and support other women specifically to grow. I didn't learn any of that. And a lot of the quote unquote boxes that corporations or, you know, bigger companies were trying to keep me in or trying to keep those roles in where, you know, you come to work at eight, you leave at five, it's a very set schedule, mm -hmm. it's very structured, and you more or less just sit down, be quiet, do your work, put your head down, and maybe in 50 years you can retire and then you can go and have a nice life. And this was more the structure that was being sold. Mm. Um, and it just didn't really work for what I wanted. Yeah, it's like, be pretty, smile, don't say too much, don't have an opinion, and you'll get far. Yes, exactly. Is that the same since we're talking about the, the men, women, Um, segmentation in professional life? Is that the same thing that would happen for men? Or is it even worse because you were a woman? Oh, that's a good question. And I, I don't, I don't like to generalize. But I mean, I do, I do see this every single day, especially with the women that I'm working with. Uh, from what I've seen, and again, this is based on my experience, but from what I've seen, it is a lot easier or more natural or what have you, insert synonym here, for men to go out, ask for what they want, you know, ask for more, put themselves out there. And even, even in business, you know, if, if they're 10% qualified, they're going to go for it. Whereas women can be 90, 95% qualified and still not feel like it's enough and constantly want to learn more and do more and be more. And yeah, it definitely presents a big, big roadblock. So actually that gets me to, to my next question, but Generally speaking, um, why is it that being um, a woman in business is actually a topic? It shouldn't be a topic. It should be the same. So there is the, the point of um, not being enough, the feeling of not being enough. Definitely. But what are the, the, the typical um, mindset blocks that you see uh, with the, the women you work with? What is it? What, what is the, the problem they're facing? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing really comes down to imposter syndrome and not feeling enough. And again, when when you're growing a business, there are different strategies you can take. There are so many different ways that you can grow and scale. You know, there's there's a million different ways that you can build a successful business. But if you are not sold on yourself, if you're not sold on the value that you provide, and if you're constantly feeling like this is not enough, why me? I'm not worth X, Y, Z. It makes it so much harder to actually grow. And, you know, you were saying it should be the same with men and women. I don't necessarily agree with that, you know, like we are typically wired a bit differently. Um, but yes, it's, it's by what I've seen, the mindset and just imposter syndrome would be the biggest block that really holds these women back and that they really need to work through in order to scale. Is there any, anything related to uh, being alone at the top? Ooh, ooh, what, what do you mean? Because this is actually something that I speak with my clients about and lots of people in the industry about like it is lonely at the top but can you expand on that question just a little bit my feeling my perspective because the coaching business owners coaching um, business leaders it's not about coaching coaching is just one tool in the middle of mentoring in the middle of listening in the middle of provoking in the middle of kicking a butt every once in a while in the middle of provoking and, um, and challenging and challenging and being a sounding board. And the people who lead a business, whether it's their business or it's a job to lead a business with, you know, other owners, mm -hmm. they're not the owner, they are professional CEOs or uh, professional C-levels. It's always, from my client's perspective, it's always alone at the top. 
it's always if I'm the commercial director and I have doubts, I can't talk about it because my boss is going to feel like I'm not enough. Um, I can't talk about it at home to my husband or to my wife because they have, you know, they don't understand they, they at don't all. They don't understand, or they they just want to be home and stop talking about work, which is fair enough. And you can't talk about your problems with your staff, otherwise they're going to leave, right? And one of my clients once said, "You're the guy typically I talk to when my wife doesn't want to listen and my team can't listen. That's my job, right? Right. And so my clients are in that position where they're alone at the top. And sometimes they're the CEO, sometimes they're the CFO, sometimes they're the CMO." But they're always at, in in a position where they have problems and they can't talk about that unless they have someone from the outside who's there for that. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, if you're a woman, is it even worse than that? You know, I, I don't know that I would say that it's worse. I would say, statistically speaking, there are far fewer women CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, COOs. You know, there are far fewer women business owners uh, who have reached that higher level, if you will. So when I say higher level, I'm talking, you know, the seven, multi-seven, eight-figure level. It, it's a much lower percentage. Uh, as far as it being lonely at the top, it's lonely at the top for everyone, which is why it's really, really helpful to have that sounding board like you were just mentioning. Uh, I think for women in particular, what I've seen to be really, really, really useful and really helpful is actually having those sounding boards because you're right. It's not something that you can necessarily talk to your husband or wife about or, and I'm generalizing for men and women here, but it's not something that you can talk to your team about or, you know, your superior, etc. So having a network, having people to bounce ideas back and forth on, having a mastermind, having a mentor, just someone who's been through that with you or before you and has navigated the other side. I don't know how that is for men. I'm assuming that it is quite helpful. But for women, that is one of the key ways that they can actually navigate that really, really lonely journey. Because being an entrepreneur can be very lonely. And again, the higher you scale and the, the more you rise, the more lonely it can be if you don't have things in place to actually support you as you're going that, you know, as you're rising. Is the, the, the mindset or the... Um let's say, the, the imposter syndrome, always the same, whatever the, the age of the women you work with? Or is it kind of evolving and changing based on their life experiences, based on their age? For instance, um, a woman becomes a mom. I've seen back in Hong Kong groups where they were like uh, kind of group coaching mm -hmm. groups for mom entrepreneurs, right? Where it was like, I'm a mom and I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm going to come there and use that group to start talking. And one of the issues were, was um, when these women were pregnant, they were like, it's okay, I'm not sick, I'm pregnant, I can still do whatever I want, right? Okay, fair enough. And then they were a mom, and so they stop for a while, which is fair. Mm -hmm. And then they have that kind of gap, and the imposter syndrome kicks in saying, well, I haven't been... Um, in activity uh, for a while because I was a mom. So uh, how do I get back into it? Because I was pregnant and then I was a mom. So at some point, it's a question of saying, okay, you know, I'm a pregnant. I'm, I'm pregnant. It's not a disease. It's just the way it is. So mm -hmm. stop making it a problem. And then it's like, okay, but I was pregnant and then it became a problem. Um, is it something that I'm making up? Is it something that's difficult to deal with for, for women in, in their professional career and in the way they are going to build their career? I, I think so. Um, and it doesn't just have to be being pregnant, honestly. Of course. You know, there's different life experiences and not yeah, everyone yeah, the, chooses to, to have children and, mm -hmm. you know, all the things there. But it is interesting that it doesn't really matter the age. So from what I've seen, this can be from, you know, women who are starting businesses in their late 20s, through their 40s, uh, sorry, through their 30s, 40s, 50s, there are still mindset traps and mindset things that they have to work through in order to get out of their own way, essentially, in order to grow their business. But what I've seen actually does work is people who are willing to be uncomfortable, still take the action, get support, and know that their mind can be used as an asset and a tool and not an impediment or you know this, this block, they go much further, much faster, but it doesn't always matter what age they are. I think some of this is also cultural. So there, there are certain cultures that do very, very well and they go very quickly. Um, 
they also tend to approach things a lot more strategically and a lot more like masculine energy, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Um, but as far as going back to your question about like women being pregnant specifically, yes, of course, there's imposter syndrome that pops up, um, but it could be other just life events. If, if someone gets in an accident or chooses to take time off to do something different or even differences in scaling, you know, the challenges with the business structure, the strategy and the mindset are very different from scaling to six figures and then scaling from six to multi-six, multi-six to seven, and then seven and beyond. Like you still have things that pop up. You still have mindset stuff that you have to work through, but it's different. Does that make sense? Yeah, but um, actually I'm interested if you can go even further than that. What could be examples? Like someone, a woman now is is looking at us and she's saying, so with, what I want is examples. So someone can say, oh, that's me. And when they, they hear that, they can say, oh, so Rhiannon is talking about that. So it's actually not just me. It's pretty common, right? So if we, we give practical nuggets, what could be those nuggets? Things that are, it feels like a trap, but it's common. Yeah. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh good question. Um, okay. So getting, getting out of your own way, like that, that's the biggest one, right? Not feeling like you're enough, not feeling like you know enough. When you're starting your business, when you are starting to grow, especially let, let's say you're getting from that zero to six figure mark. Okay. Um, feeling like you don't know enough or that you have to constantly learn more or wait until it feels like the right time. This is a lie. This is absolutely a lie. And this is your brain trying to protect you to keep you safe because it's scary putting yourself out there in order to grow your business, get visible. Exactly. Because you, you don't know how people are going to react. So there's a lot of fear that pops up there. Uh, either fear of judgment, fear of success, fear of failure, fear of multiple things, you know, what people are going to think, or what if this does work, or what if this doesn't work? And this is such a common thing. And it is all about your brain, literally just trying to keep you safe and trying to protect you. Everyone goes through this. Even guys. Even guys. Yeah, everyone goes through this. I I do think it is, from what I've seen, a bit easier for guys to navigate through than the women that I've worked with. But still, everyone goes through this. Okay, let's say you hit your six figures, okay? Or you know, you're, you're hitting consistent 10 K months, 20 K months, 30 K months, whatever. You're actually generating some revenue. You're doing really well. You've got clients coming in, you've got referrals, you've got people raving about your product or service. Like things are actually working. Different things that pop up then are literally holding on to it. So if you don't feel worthy of holding on to it, or you don't feel like you can constantly keep showing up and keep maintaining this, Oftentimes what can happen is you go back down, you know, you, you end up losing momentum, you lose revenue, you lose clients, you lose sales. And a lot of that again is, is in your mind. It's not the strategy. It's not the action you're taking. It's maybe the action you're not taking or self-sabotaging yourself. Mm -hmm. So just knowing that that is also really common and working through, okay, I do know what I'm doing. Look at the data. I have really good results. My clients are raving about my product and service. Like, I can do this. I can hold this. That's very, very different from just getting started. And again, as you continue to scale, when you're at 50, 60, 70, 100 K months, whatever that looks like. And again, different variations of success for different people. But when we're talking about building six, multi six, seven, multi seven, eight figure businesses, this obviously has a lot of revenue coming into it. But being able to actually hold it, I found is the biggest challenge when you are getting to that higher level mark. Like, realizing, hey, I am worthy of this. Hey, I can still maintain. I can still hold this. I am creating a legacy and making it okay that it feels really hard and really challenging, but knowing that you can continue and you can continue to scale. So what's the the, the issue there? Is it um, feeling guilty about being successful or is it a question of um, having another definition of scaling as in scaling isn't about increasing and keeping the increase up? Um, but it's a question of saying, okay, you need to delegate, you need to structure that Mm -hmm. so that the business is going to keep working and you don't have to feel like you're not enough. Right. I don't think it's about guilt, uh, especially as clients get higher and they have scaled. And, and again, I'm trying to use like actual tangible examples of, you know, past that multi six, seven, multi seven figure mark. It actually isn't about guilt 
The reason being, if you are feeling guilty at that point, like you've had to do the work in order to not hold that guilt or you wouldn't get to that point. So that is actually more common as you're getting to like that six and slightly beyond. Like, oh my goodness, like I'm actually making money now. I can help support my family. I can help support these causes I believe in, but I feel guilty for having all of this and other people don't. You really, really, really have to work through that. Um, And if you can just go back to that second question that you had after guilt, I wanted to make sure to touch on that. The other one is, uh, it's not guilt, it's about structuring. Yes, yes. So obviously, as you're growing, what you don't want to be doing is trading your time for money. And it's really, really important to have a solid infrastructure to delegate, to automate, to eliminate, you know, to make sure that you've got a team that can step in or someone who is helping to run things because otherwise, yeah, you're making a lot more money, but then you're sacrificing your time or you're giving up time with your family or your friends or you're you're just working 24/7 and then then you burn out and you know that's not sustainable either. So making sure that as you're growing, not after you've already gotten to a certain point, you are mindful and conscious to actually set up those structures, those systems, those platforms in place, which is also the flip side of the coin where my team comes in, just as a side note. Speaking of the big stakes, what does it take to go from 99 to six figures, 99K to six figures. Mm-hmm. What does it take to go from six figures to multi six figures? Mm-hmm. And what does it take to go from multi six figures to seven plus figures? And we're not going to talk about eight figures and the rest because okay. <laughs> that's a bit too far for now. Okay, no problem. I, so in order to get to your first six figures, really, truly, it is mastering your mind, but working on your imposter syndrome and knowing that you already have enough and that you know enough and not consistently pushing it off and trying to learn more and you know waiting until you're ready. Literally working through that imposter syndrome, being scared and doing it anyway and taking the action, this is how you get to your first six figures. Okay, also working on a lot of the guilt that pops up that we just mentioned uh, because as you start to make more money, you know, other things start popping up. Um, going into multi six figures, This is when it's harder to hold, or from what I've seen, it's harder to hold. You know, people are consistently making good money. They've got a product that is actually working. They've got a service that is actually working, you know, whatever their business looks like. But it can be very, very difficult to actually hold that unless you're working through not sabotaging your success. And again, it it sounds crazy, but I have seen clients in the past literally they're on just such a forward momentum and they are doing such amazing things, generating great revenue. And it, it's like one day they just really, really struggle um, with being able to hold it all and, and feeling like they're worthy and, you know, continuing to generate that income. Is it like um, too much work means you're tired all of a sudden and you have the, you know, the, the, the weight of the world on your shoulders? Is it uh, decision fatigue? It's both. It's both. So... You get to a cusp in your business, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, you know, with tons of your clients, but you get to a cusp of you're finally making enough money, but then you need to be mindful that you're not trading in that time for money. You know, you've got to be setting up the structures, the systems, and this is usually when you're getting to that multi six figure mark. You've got to actually have the infrastructure in place yeah, to actually time, be able to hold it. Exactly. Time, time is the wrong currency. So as long as exactly. you, you understand it, you can you can start building up and scaling because it becomes a matter of organizing instead of just selling. Yes, exactly. And if you've got the right team in place and you've got the right people, you know, underneath you, so your operations managers, you've got good people who are actually going and implementing, like this can help carry you and can help support you you do have to make sure that you have the right people in in that role though. Otherwise, you really can just want to blow it up again because it all falls back on your lap. Um, but actually having the structure and the support in place so that you can hold it all. And this, this can be really, really difficult for people as well, like allowing other people to support them, feeling good enough to let them be supported. And, you know, it, it's interesting as well because it's not just in the business. This can also be hiring somebody to help clean your house you know, hiring a food delivery service so that you've got nutritious food and you're not spending two hours in the kitchen trying to make dinner. And, you know, these are things that I think are often overlooked because this takes up time. This takes up mental resources. This takes up bandwidth. Do you think women are more 
um, have more difficulties than men to accept yes. that? Yes. Seriously? Yes. A hundred percent. Really? There's so much mindset work that goes into so many of my clients accepting support. And accepting support, again, can be on the personal side of things or the business side of things. But personal side, as we said, having someone come in and help clean, having someone come in and help cook or food delivery. Business side can be having support in a team to help implement things or having support of someone else take some of these decisions off of your plate. It is a lot harder from what I've seen for women to actually accept that help. And then where they get in a trap is they burn out, they're trading all their time for money, and they build a business that they absolutely have no interest in running anymore because they have no time. We had uh, that typical example with a male client, but it's the same topic, who was not a client when obviously we started talking with him. Mm -hmm. And his point was, no, I don't need to be coached. I don't need help. My team does. Oh, this is so an interesting said, well, one. Th that's okay. You know, we're, we know how to handle teams. The reality is that we started handling the team, but we have him on the phone at least once a week. Okay. So he doesn't need it, but he's the, the biggest consumer of the sounding board kind of thing. Clever. Um, is it the same? No. So it's it's not feeling like they know it all and they have all of the answers. It's flipped from what I've seen. It's they don't feel like they have enough of the answers or they don't know it all, but they struggle to ask for support and they struggle accepting support. So is it they don't know that they don't know? It's an absolute blind spot. Or is it they know that they don't know? <laughs> that one varies. That one does vary okay. because some, you know, some are very they've had good success and they're building things and, you know, like their business is taking off, but they don't know all of the things that they need in order to help scale. And whether that's an infrastructure standpoint or a mindset standpoint and others are just so overwhelmed and so frazzled, they know that they need help, but they either struggle to ask for it or they're so desperate for that help by the time they do ask for it, that it's just too late. Yes. Now, I hesitate to say too late because I don't ever want to say it's ever too late, but this is why it's so important as you are in that building and scaling phase, especially when you're, you know, beyond six figures scaling to multi six. It's so important to actually take the time and the energy and the money as well to actually get some of those infrastructure elements in place. So systems, processes, procedures, team, start automating things, start eliminating things, start delegating things, because otherwise... You, you're like a runaway train and then you're constantly just trying to catch up and just, you know, just chasing, chasing, chasing the train and it's just about to fly off the rails and you're trying to bring someone in or trying to set something up and you're chasing a runaway train instead of as it's starting to get going, you're implementing these processes, you're onboarding these team members. It's a very different scenario, the first versus the second. So practically speaking, how do you help them? Ooh, ooh, good question. Uh, so most of the clients that come to me, especially the women that I'm working with, now I do have a couple of men that I support, but primarily the women that I'm supporting, um, we start with a very holistic approach. So what struggles are you having? Where do you want to take your business? What do you actually want your life to look like? It's not just, hey, you want a seven figure business? Great. Here's how I can help because there's so much more to it than that. It's interesting because, sorry, I'm interrupting you. That's but okay. It's interesting because this, what you, what you said holistic, looking at what the ladies want to do, what, how, what they want with their life, mm -hmm. um, what vision they want for the business and all that. When I talk about that with male clients, they go like, oh man, this is bullshit. <laughs> really? And they say, you know, vision is not going to pay the bills. Oh, okay. Is it different? Do women understand that this is more serious than it sounds and that this is very practical and this is the well this is the real powerhouse if you know where you start from and mm -hmm. where you want to get it's a lot easier are they aware of that or do you have to push do you have to insist on explaining it building the awareness no i don't really have to build their awareness because if if they're in my orbit if they're in my world uh, they're already familiar a little bit with you know who i am how i work my process and typically this is really organic we're we're not we're not really working a lot with like cold leads, for example, like I, I very much care for the humans that I work with and I very much want to support them and make sure that they are supported 
in every area of their life. So there's not a lot of convincing. There's not a lot of like talking them into this is how my process works and this is what we're going to do. And if that is needed, then they're typically not the best fit either for me or I'm not the best fit for them, which is completely okay. So no, that's not really, that's not really an issue that I experience. But as far as looking at it holistically, you know, it's interesting that you say that about men, like, oh, this vision is bullshit. And like, that doesn't pay the bills. Let's just go, go, go. You know, this is where a lot of the women that I've worked with have really struggled because they feel like they have to just power through and do things a certain way or they're not enough and they need to be coached through that and like actually look at what they want, how they want their business to look, how they want their life to look. Because what I don't ever want is for someone, especially who's worked with me, to ever feel like they've built a business that that doesn't support their life, you know, that doesn't actually support how they want to live on a day-to-day basis, how they want to raise their family, or if they want to travel or whatever it is, you know, everything looks different for different people, but it's a very holistic approach. So it's really getting clear on, hey, these next five years, you want to, yeah, you want to scale to multi-millions? Amazing. What are you willing to do in order to actually make that happen? And why do you actually want this? Because if it's just a vanity metric, it's not going to work. That's a good point. Um, have you seen women say, I want to reach X millions, mm-hmm. as in a vanity m- matrix, mm-hmm. just a number for a number? Or is it usually, I want to reach X millions for a reason? Or is it the goal, like, I want a business that runs for me when I'm with the kids mm-hmm. or, or living my life traveling? Um what is their perspective on how to set a big goal for themselves? Yeah, so it can be all of those three that you just mentioned. The one caveat, though, is when it is just, oh, I want a seven-figure business in the next year. Okay, great. Why? Why, Why do you want that? Oh, because it sounds cool. And so you see that with women as well? I see that some. It's not as prevalent, but I have seen that with some. And then when we actually break down, you know, why they want this, what they want it for, you know, what are the actual things that they want to achieve because of this? We can work backwards from there, of course, but this is the smaller percentage of of people that I've worked with. And it is cool though, because you can see a light bulb moment go off like, great, like, do you actually need seven figures in order to feel worthy? Do you actually need seven figures in order to, you know, live this type of lifestyle? And usually the answer is no, but... When we take it from a different approach, when we take it from, okay, let's build a business that you love, that actually supports your life, that allows you to travel, that allows you to, you know, spend all the time at home. And maybe you have one call day per week and you work 20 hours a week and you're still making 500K. You know, it's funny because what actually ends up happening is they're very passionate about what they do. They're very happy in other elements of their life. They're not just sacrificing everything to grow their business and then their business just continues to grow as a result. It's fascinating. But it's interesting because from the the guy perspective, I mean, what I see is uh, clients saying, our business needs to be that amount of millions next year. Why? Because it has to be that amount of millions next year. Mm -hmm. Why? How's that working for you? Because it has to be the same. (laughs) How is that working for you? And yeah, and they they don't, again, vision thing is BS and, and... they, they have a number in mind without being able to say why, without being able to, you know, to just say because I want the money in. Okay, but so why? Do they ever give you an actual answer? No. Or is, no? No, we, we, we force it. We, we find a way to, to, to put the things on the table and say, okay, is it because you want to sell the business? Is it because the valuation of the business requires that you reach that amount of money, then the business is worth that much and then you can sell the business. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to sell the business. I just want to make money. Okay. So it's it's actually a tricky thing, but um, I'm re- realizing in, in the way you're speaking about it, that it's probably easier for women to put a human justification behind it, whereas the guys are maybe more just not caring about the human or the, the impact of it. They're just focusing on the result I want is money. Yep. I I could definitely see that being a much more challenging topic, specifically working with men. Whereas women, you you can kind of reframe that if that's something that they're struggling with. And, you know, they do have different things that they want. And like, you know, you, you don't typically, you don't start a business 
because you found an amazing job that was flexible and supported your lifestyle. Like, no, you, you started a business for a specific reason, either to help someone or to have more time at home with your kids or to have freedom, flexibility, whatever. And so with most of my clients, we can hone back in on that and then actually take steps forward to support them in reaching whatever goal it is. And then they just grow from there. When we prepared that, that discussion, um, you said in the end, the client is the bottleneck. Yes. Why? I mean, we've, we've started to, to answer that question, but in your own words. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, usually the, the clients are the ones who don't get out of their own way. And oftentimes this is mindset, again, not feeling like they're enough or, you know, they're an imposter. Sometimes it's about letting control go. Sometimes it's not feeling like they can actually have support. But yeah, when the clients are the bottleneck, like they're holding up all of the processes, they're holding up all of the growth, they're, hold, they're yeah, holding up the forward trajectory of the business. Um, usually it is mindset though. There is the, the thing about controlling, mm -hmm. right? Is it, is it working, um, I mean, is it a problem you see a lot? Controlling as far as? People being control freaks. Yes. And saying, this is my business. My business is my baby. I want to control. I want to make sure it's fine. Or um, I mean, I'm saying that because, for instance, we, we had a, uh, another discussion right here uh, a few weeks ago with Camilla. Um, oh, yeah. And you can check the video. Um, and Camilla was saying, you know, I haven't written a, a LinkedIn post in years mm -hmm. because I trust my team and I try to let go. I try to let go. Mm -hmm. I build a topic. I see a topic. I make it work and then I, I, I train people and I let go, I let go, I let go. My mm -hmm. business is something I let go. I'm still in charge, but people are managing. Is it something that's difficult? I think so, yes. And I, I think it's something that a lot of clients that I've worked with, they have been burned in the past, either from coaches, consultants, team members, and then it makes it even harder to trust and to give autonomy. But if you want to actually scale successfully, You, you have to give up some of that control. And the most successful clients that I've seen and the happiest ones and the ones who, you know, are working one day a week and still clearing half a mil, um, guess what? They're not checking blog posts. They're not checking emails. They are showing up for these CEO-related tasks, client delivery, and making sure that they are really nailing whatever it was the client signed up for. Otherwise they're out. They trust the team to run things. They trust the trajectory of the business and they let everything else go. Now, those who are such control freaks, micromanaging, they need to sign off on everything. They need to check every single detail. They get burnt out. They get frazzled. Team members get annoyed. It's, it's very, very, very hard to get past that. So you do have to actively work on either taking a step back or getting the right people in in the right seats and then trusting them to actually do the job that you've hired them to do. It's the uh, it's what I usually call having a Caesar without the generals. Mm -hmm. And it's that's really the thing. It's uh, if you if you well, I mean, the, the, the reason why Julius Caesar had generals and the generals had centurions and centurions had decurions is because you can't manage directly more than eight, 10 people anyway. Exactly. And so as long as you try to do things yourself, you're never going to go past that number. Yep. It, really, you, you can't. You can't. You're only human. And if you are going past that number, there is a trade-off. It is either you have no time for yourself, you have no time for your family, you no. have no friends, you know, you're getting no sleep. And so many business owners have been there. And I think you and I talked about this in our discussion, but when I was in the building phase, I was working 120-hour weeks. Like, I... I didn't have time to eat. I didn't have time for anything. And that is not a sustainable way to build a business. But it is helpful actually having been through that because I understand how people can get there and also how they can get out of it. But the Caesar example of having, you know, having people under and then everyone under that is a perfect analogy. It's um, change management as well. Mm-hmm. Is it something that you handle quite a lot? I mean, do you talk about it as in, so today we are going to talk about change management or is it something that you do without mentioning it? Um, good question. Um, yes, there is a lot of change, man change management that comes in, especially when there are team members who 
aren't the right fit for the business. And again, when I when I come in, it is a very holistic approach. We really start with diving in to where the client wants to go, what mindset blocks, what bottlenecks they are presenting. And then we start looking at infrastructure. And with that, it's operations. And then we support with marketing. But sometimes there are team members who have been involved in the business for years and years, and they're just, they're not a fit anymore, or the entire team is not a fit anymore. So of course we have to address that. It's not in every single business, but it is something that we do support with. Yeah. The, and the, the, the difficulty with change management is that when you talk about change management, it sounds like a big topic. Um, a friend of mine from, from Hong Kong um, had like big shot kind of job working for one of the, the big five uh, consulting firms in Asia. Okay, nice. You know, you take the phone, you have every prime minister on the phone and all that. And his job was to do change management for large organizations and all that. So when he was talking about change management, it felt like, oh man, I'm not, it's out of my league. There is nothing I can do with that. And the point is that's wrong because whatever the size of your business, you spend your time deciding in a phase of uncertainty mm -hmm. and every day you have to do change management, whether you like it or not and whether you're aware or not, right? Yes, exactly. But this is also why it's so important to actually have that infrastructure in place and mm -hmm. have, you know, it's, it's so not a sexy topic, but like having your processes documented and like having things in place. So yeah, definitely not sexy, but no, but it, this helps you to scale. And, and again, when you're getting past that six figure mark, it's a necessity. And then if you have to come in and do change management, it's not so disruptive. The business can still continue on. It's not so detrimental as well. Back to the MBA point. Mm -hmm. um, that's something they're not touching on. On change management? Change management in a small business kind of perspective. When I went through my MBA, and I, again, I graduated in 2012, so the programs may be different now, but no, this is not something that we covered. But is it because, so your MBA was related to entrepreneurship somehow? No. So my MBA, again, like not a whole lot to do with being an entrepreneur, um, which may have been the reason why it wasn't so useful, but it was on finance and economics. Okay. Yeah, you know, good topics to have, things that you need to know when you build a business, but for the most part, that entire degree was useless in actually being an entrepreneur and growing a business. But the point anyway with MBAs is that it's going to take you one year, two years, it's expensive. Um, and the reality is when you start a business, you bootstrap it, you yep. do quick and dirty, you try, you test, you fail, you fail, you fail, you test again. You, I mean, the money you put in an MBA and the time you put in an MBA is kind of disproportionate compared of to the, the undertaking of building a building a business in a company. Exactly. But again, like if you are <clears throat> if you are interested in climbing the corporate ladder, if you want a cushy, you know, retirement account, like specifically if you're not in Europe, I'm talking about the US because that's where I'm from and that's where I got my MBA. But there are benefits, of course, and it depends on what you actually want for your life. Like if you're happy with risk and you're happy with you know, high risk, high reward. Great. Go be an entrepreneur. It's really freaking hard. And also you can absolutely do it and you can scale it. Um, speaking of MBAs, um, what's the, the switch between having a corporate kind of career, kind of corporate mindset, corporate experience, very heavy with systems, structures, teams. This is my job. This is not yours. This is your job. This is not mine. Very uh, compartmentalized. And switching to being an entrepreneur and having to do everything. Have you seen that? And how do women actually cope with it? Yes, great question. And yes, I have seen that. So for past and current clients who have come from corporate companies and then started to become an entrepreneur, uh, they were a lot more strategic and they were a lot more structured, which is beneficial. But there has definitely been a big shift in actually having to carry it all and hold it all. So oftentimes these clients really struggle with the financials. Um, there is a lot of push, 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 uh, grow, 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 and higher, higher, higher. And, you know, they do see the long-term vision, but then maybe they're not quite ready for all of these things yet. The business hasn't caught up. It can't actually support them. These are oftentimes the clients who come to me and they are in the red, 
they know they want to run this business, they know they want to grow it, but they don't understand why they're not actually making money, even when they've got six figures plus turnover, they're in the red as far as profit. And that is nine times out of 10, those who are coming from corporate, which is very interesting. The mindset is very different. I mean, the, it is. if you want to summarize it, you would say um, whoever is the CEO of Google or the CEO of Microsoft today is not Bill Gates. And the guy who built right. Microsoft is Bill Gates. Right? right. And maybe the CEO today, today's CEO of Microsoft would not be able to actually build Microsoft from scratch. Right. right. So there is the, the mindset of the creator, the guy who's the guy or the lady, of course, who started things. And then there is somehow the professional CEO that kicks in. And it's not the same. I've, I've seen that a few times, but at some point, one professional CEO came in a business and was very smart ass with me saying, you know what, they gave me the key and they said, don't lose it. There is just one. And very pretentious, very quite a bit to chew. Mm -hmm. And he lasted for seven months. And then at some point, one of the co-founders came back in and said, so we tried to go from founder-led to CEO-led. And it didn't and work. It didn't work. And we came back to co-founder-led kind of thing. So the, the wiring and the mindset of people who are corporate is not the same as the one from people who are actually the, the builders in the first place. True. It's Very true. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult switch. But... Oftentimes, the corporate ones are a lot quicker to hire and get help. Yeah, and because they know. And it's a and it's something you need at some point exactly. when you are the founder. You are wired to start building things, and then at some point you have to let go. You have to say, "I can't." It's 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 a, it becomes a professional job. Yes. Exactly. Do you work with corporate people? I work with corporate people who have shifted into becoming an entrepreneur. Not the other way around? No, not the other way around as of yet. Yeah. Hmm. Might be an opening for that. It, it might be an opening for that. Might hmm. be an opening for that, especially with the uh, leadership that corporate, you, corporates have a big focus on that. Let's talk about leadership. <laughs> okay. Perfect transition. <laughs> Good segue. Thank you very much for that. So PhD in international leadership. That's <laughs> what you're working on at the moment. Correct. Um International leadership. Mm -hmm. What is that? I feel like this is pretty self-explanatory, but <laughs> what's the what's the difference? I mean, there okay. is leadership. There is international leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a skill. International leadership is what? What's the difference? Okay, let me let me answer your question by answering how I chose this, and then we'll go into that. But I knew that I wanted to get a PhD with some type of leadership. I knew that I wanted some type of international elements and that was very, very, very difficult to find. Most of the leadership PhDs that I was finding were for uh, organizational leadership, which was not really something that was my cup of tea. So- What is it? Organizational leadership? Organi what's what's the, the, the definition of that? Why is that something? I don't know that I can give you an exact definition, but oftentimes if you're getting a PhD in organizational leadership, you're going um, and you're supporting corporations or bigger companies, um, you know, you can either do trainings or you can step in and help them, I don't know, with different areas. Obviously, I didn't go in that, um, but it's really focused on specifically, from my understanding, actually going into corporations and bigger organizations and you get a permanent position there and you help them. So it's like US kind of based or very European based? No, the programs segmented? that I found were very much US based. There were a couple European based, but it wasn't any focus on like how you can become a better leader and like support smaller teams or support women or anything like that. Um, so the international leadership standpoint was on different strategies, different tactics to become a better leader from an international perspective. This is what I took away from this. Uh, so again, for me, being very international, you know, I haven't I haven't lived in the States in what almost a decade, something like that. My business is all over. My clients are all over. That was really, really important for me to actually be able to have, again, a very world view, not just not just a very specific US based, Coming in to help a corporation, boom, go. That was not really what I wanted to do. Did you see um, when when you were um, 
living around Singapore. Um, did you did you see anything of the leadership methods over there? What do you mean the different methods over there? The way they the Asian culture is actually using leadership and living leadership Oof. is very different from the way you would do it in the U.S. and also very different from the way you would do it in Europe. I mean, yes. it's a line, right? On the yes. one hand, one side you have the U.S. way, you have the Asian way on the other, and Europe is somehow in the middle. And so it's a cursor that you 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 push, you move along. Mm -hmm. and so what would be the difference? You know, honestly, even though because I was in Singapore for two years and, you know, I have um, my company has got a subsidiary there. I, I feel like I'm not even very well equipped to answer that because I wasn't in corporate and I wasn't specifically working with like corporations and bigger companies. I, I feel like I'm very much an anomaly with the focuses that I have, the clients that I work with, you know, really focusing on like like that nonprofit we talked about, like community over competition. Um, but from the actual work culture, from what I saw from different people going on the grind, it is very much work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have a life. And, you know, maybe there's a good opportunity for a pay increase there, especially if you are coming from outside the country. A lot of people move there and they're very transient. They're there for a couple of years. They make very good money and then they come back. But it is very work, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle. Organization yes. crushing, crushing the human. Yes, more or less. How would you define it? The, the Western, I'm not saying European or US way, but Western way is getting more and more... Um, I mean, it's, it's a tricky topic. Last week, this week, actually, there was a news online that was pretty interesting where Dell, the mm -hmm. uh, IT company, said to people, oh, you know what? You have to come back to the office. Otherwise, you're going to lose on your benefits or oh, this or no. that. And that's kind of, okay, they didn't get the point. They with, didn't get the like, memo. <laughs> uh, they didn't get the memo on uh, employer branding. They didn't. I mean, who is thinking about their leadership kind of logic in there, right? Mm. So I was going to say, okay, the, the Asian version of leadership is uh, the organization is kind of crushing the human. And it's Many not times, that, yes. that much the case in the Western kind of logic where it's more about human rather than organization. But the example I'm just giving there is also about the organization crushing the human. Well, it's about the bottom line, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I, and I do feel like it is... It is different in Europe, not all the time, but by and large, it is much more, you know, family focused and human focused. And you're not working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and just being crushed. It, you know, it's, it's a bit more flipped again, based on your organization and who you're working with. But I would say from what I've seen, it's, it's very much Asia is on the far left the U.S. is more in the middle, and then Europe is a lot more lax and a lot more chill, and you do have more of that work-life balance. So, yeah, it, it really varies based on which region of the world that you're in. The point in your um, PhD, we, we talked about that, and uh, I was pretty interested in the impact of it. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's, your, what's the focus you're looking at? Is it how... Is it about pure leadership? Is it about how you can use leadership to transform businesses? Is it about um, local communities? What's what's the what's the point? Yeah. So one really cool thing about getting a PhD is you do have a basic structure, of course, and you've got your classes, your courses, all the things. But when you do your dissertation, or at least in my program, you have a lot of freedom and flexibility with which direction you want to go in. So mine specifically is really focused on impact and how business and skills can support. Nah, hold on. Let me rephrase this. We tried to find a, a quick two sentence uh, overview since I talked a lot on this. Um, what is the final sentence that we came up with? It's impact and how women having knowledge and skills and starting businesses, etc., can impact an entire community, which has a ripple, a ripple effect, and can in, impact an entire country. Yeah, it's a, it's a big point. It is. It's a big point, and the the, the interesting thing with that is, um, the point, the part that I like with what you're doing is that it's very difficult, and I've seen quite a few because I've been through the PhD lane myself, and it's very difficult to see people who do a PhD thinking. 
it's going to be useful in something and I have to translate the research into plain English people yes. can understand <laughs> right now. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's difficult. But in the end, that's the point. The point is to, to go through a long process that's going to change lives, right? Exactly. So communities, women, communities, business, and how all that can, can work together. Mm -hmm. Two final questions. Okay. One is, what's the, um, this is a good one. <laughs> what's the relationship between leadership, business, and Harry Potter? Oh, Are you, are you I, I remember your oh, point. No. I told you I would bring it back. So where is the common point? Um, oh, goodness. Okay. I, I forgot we even talked about this. I feel like I need to give context in this Hufflepuff. Go on. <laughs> okay. So if you're familiar with Harry Potter, there are four different houses. There's Gryffindor, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Slytherin, and Hufflepuff. And I did a really interesting experiment where... I had certain women who were in my circle who really wanted support in growing businesses, but they needed a very, very different approach than the typical type of client that I work with. So what I mean by this is they weren't focused on the money. They weren't focused on, you know, really scaling, scaling, scaling and working 24 seven in a company or a job or as an entrepreneur that they didn't really, they didn't really want to be doing. Uh, instead, it was about fulfillment. It was really building a business and building a life that fulfilled them and supported their lifestyle and where they wanted to go. So these were typically women who weren't willing to sell their soul for money. They weren't willing to do something that didn't make them happy. They wouldn't do something that didn't light them up. So to answer your question, if you're a Hufflepuff, <laughs> um, you are probably going to approach business and leadership and life very differently than a lot of other business owners, especially as women. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? So it means you have to start with asking yourself, well, first you have to get the movies or read the books. <laughs> It's good luck with that. But, but you don't but, you don't have to know Harry Potter because it, it, it is a type of, it's a personality type yeah. and all the things. But it, it means, the joke aside, it's a serious point. It means you have to figure out who you are in the first place. Yes. And what you look like and what your inner values and how you're, how you're wired, basically. Yes. And if you know how you're wired and what is important to you, we come back to the holistic approach, then you can decide how you're going to do business. Yes. And just because... I do it one way or someone else does it a different way doesn't mean it's wrong. No. There are so many different ways to build a business. There are so many different reasons that we have for building a business. And again, as long as we are taking that holistic approach and as long as we are actually building a business that supports a life that we love and not one that we just we're sacrificing our entire life to pour into our business, like that's the whole point. All right. Um, two more questions, okay. actually. I, I said I had two, so my, my own question is coming next. But you first. Is there a question I didn't ask? Is there a topic that we didn't talk about? Ooh, I think we did a really good job of, of hitting most things. Oh, I didn't think about a question I wanted to ask you. If, if um, so again, hi, uh, women are looking at the, the video now. Is there anything that they're going to say, they missed that, they didn't talk about it? I wanted to hear about that. Let me think about this. I can't think of anything. What's the the big thing they have to remember? Just go for it. Just go for it. Really, just just go for it. You know enough. You are enough. Everyone goes through these struggles. Everyone has a hard time, especially in the beginning. You can do it. Take the action. You don't need another course. You don't need to learn more things. Just go and fail forward and fail fast. And don't do it alone. And don't do it alone. It's important. It is. It's important. Okay, so my um, last question. What can guys do to, that's a tough one, uh, walk a mile in a lady's shoes and help? Ooh. Because as I said, you know, from our guy perspective, life is life, business is business. And mm -hmm. we don't realize that things are different. Um, but as you said, uh, men, women are wired differently. They are. Mars, Venus, and all that. <laughs> um, how can we put ourselves in your shoes to say, okay, let's, let's try to think differently for a minute. 
Very good question. I think the first thing that I would say on that would be it is not just black and white. It is not just business on one side and, you know, proceed as usual and then personal on the other side. For women, usually it is more intertwined. It is more integrated. There's a lot more emotion involved. Not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but just... It's a good point, actually. That's definitely a lot more emotion involved. Um, And just realizing that there are different approaches. And, you know, without going into a whole different topic, oftentimes, like, women can be run over and taken advantage of. And again, this works into all of the mindset things and stuff that pops up. But just just realizing, like, it is a lot more emotional. It is a lot more human first. It is a lot more integrated. It is not just black and white. It's a lot more gray. The emotional aspect of it is, is really interesting. Um, there is a... Um I'm not trying to turn this into a joke, not at all, but there is a very funny video online that's called um, The Nothing Box. Have you heard of that? I have not. So look at, look look for it on Google. I think it was probably around the 90s, something like that. And okay. it was uh, uh, just a, a show online where, um, not online actually, uh, where a guy was having an audience and two um, statues, like the one that's right behind you. Okay. And the brain of a man and the brain of a woman. And he was going from one to the other to explain how men were thinking and how women were thinking. And the audience were couples. And so when he was talking about the men, the women were laughing like, oh, yeah, that's the thing. You know? And so he was saying that the men are thinking with compartments. So there is one box for the car, one box for the kids, one box for the finance, one box for work one box for the wife, one box for the mother, and you don't mix the the different boxes. Mm -hmm. And then the women are like laughing and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he goes to the second brain and he goes like, you know, (laughs) electrons going (laughs) around and emotions connecting everything. And the the car is the the wife's car and the mom is not allowed in, you know, and it becomes messy. And that's because everything is connected to emotions, Mm -hmm. which is why women remember dates very easily and why men need to have the the date of their wedding uh, written in the ring because the women remember it because it's the date is tied to an emotion yep or as we don't remember the, the things the same way so when you realize that the mindset is based on compartmentalizing or based on dealing with emotions it changes the whole reality of doing business isn't it absolutely and there's no one right or wrong answer no, it's just the way it is it's just the way it is yes but it is very different working with women versus working with men. And you just brought up a really good point as to why. So awareness. Awareness, absolutely. So guys, when you finish that video, um, think about how the women work with their own emotions and try to help them a bit more and be more comprehensive, I guess. That's the, that's the point. It's not about helping. They don't need help. They need yeah, I was going to say it's not necessarily space. about helping. It's just, just being mindful. Mindful. That's being a good mindful. one. And ladies, just go for it. Yeah, go for it. All right. You can do it. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Thank you so much. And see you next time. Yeah, see you next time. Thanks, everyone. And you know how to do it. Um, a little like helps with the algorithm and all that. And subscribing helps too. And see you on the next one. Cheers.